This video was only made possible through the very generous contributions of my patrons. Thank you. While the ISTJ represents, I think, a paradox of optimism and pessimism, where they tend to express almost sardonically a sense of future doom, whilst inside they are actually quite confident in their ability to weather the future and push on through the storm. But the ISFJ does not seem to have this same hope, at least not naturally, but is more fundamentally pessimistic about the future whilst maintaining outside a more optimistic demeanor for other people's sake. The ISFJ is reserved in ways very similar to the INFJ in that one often feels they aren't really getting to know them in themselves. But I think in some ways the ISFJ can come off as even more reserved insofar as they do not seem to care or perhaps even be aware that they come off as secretly reserved. They are common sense philosophers, insofar as they do have rational, introverted thinking justifications for their methods and actions, but these are not overly theoretical, or at least don't come off that way. They are both refreshingly straightforward and practical justifications for straightforward and practical actions. They are not natural dreamers or inventors, but are very down to earth. From the point of view of a more dominantly intuitive type, one is struck by the ISFJ's stamina and endurance in matters of meticulousness, detail, and remaining so dutifully commonsensical about everything without even breaking a sweat. Alternatively, they are far more conserved on any theoretical or future-oriented or otherwise speculative questions and issues. They seem to take rather longer and can often seem uncomfortable or befuddled when they have to give a speculative answer on something, not because they actually are befuddled, but because it requires they make a blind leap from the sure footing of petrified history into the shifting sands of what they have not yet experienced. They come off as much more restrained than the ISTJ, uh, perhaps even repressed uh, in some cases, in the sense that they don't proffer humor, except as they feel would be appropriate for the other party, and generally don't do anything that will upset or destabilize the situation. Except in those cases where the ISFJ feels an ethical line has been crossed or violated and they need to put their foot down, at which point they become an ardent ethicist and an obstinate noble rebel. Their hackles are raised, their guard is up, and their stance makes one feel ethically judged and challenged. The image I get off of them is of an heir to an increasingly politically obsolete throne a born member of a once great and terrible royal family who, due to the vicissitudes of history, have now lost their former glory, until now they are, more or less, aristocratic figureheads. Into this situation, the ISFJ is born, and more than that, for the nation is at a point of moral crisis, and the ISFJ finds themselves in a position of influence among the public. So using their nobility, refinement, and manners, they must engage a rather uncouth world and help restore their own nobility as well as help their own family find relevance again. In short, a noble sensibility engaging with the world for the world's benefit. A typical attribute of dominant introverted perceiving is the sense that the individual is carrying a great deal around with them in their head, a lot of baggage, one could say. It is without clear organization, but comes to bear on every situation, and because of the complexity of the inner relations of the material, the introverted perceiver is capable of making very involved and unique associations between things, associations that only they would make because of their unique inner worldview. This can also lead them to having unexpected reactions to seemingly inordinate things, and trying to untangle all the threads that led to the reaction is an involved psychoanalytic process. 
This tangle, wisdom, or baggage, whichever term you prefer, is a lifetime accumulation of impressions and memories. Now, although the NI type is supplied by SE, its actual impressions do not come from anything actual in the outside world, but in fact come from their own mind conjecturing about the allegedly secret causes and implications of things. So it is their mental interpretation of the thing that impresses them, not the thing itself. Hence, the NI type's sense of inspiration and brilliant epiphany, especially after prolonged isolation and sensory deprivation. For the SI type, however, it is the thing itself that concerns them and impresses them and that they are dependent on in a certain way. They have a stronger link to the external world in this way. The SI type's worldview, their total wisdom or baggage, is not built from personal epiphanies about the possible, but from personal experiences with the actual. They retain, like wet concrete, whatever details of an experience impressed them the most, and they are not built to easily forget things any more than concrete gives up the indentations that are now set on its surface. I think it is useful to refer to Jesse Garoyer, a past writer on CelebrityTypes.com, and their platonic treatment of introversion and extroversion. For Garoyer, a function like extroverted sensation is concerned with the individual instances of sensations, that is, with individual present moments of experience, taken on their own, represented directly and fully to the subject. For them, perceived reality is what is simply given. Conversely, introverted sensation is concerned with the transcendent form of various sensations. That is, where what is given immediately to the subject from outside is mistrusted, in favor of what the subject determines to be more universally the case. This generally means that the SI type's past experiences are used to shed light on present ones, because the present data or appearance of things is not trusted until it has been processed and approved by the subject in this way. In short, one could say that SE perceives a sensation passing them by, whereas SI perceives the sensation that a passing sensation relates to. That is, the essential bottom-line kinds of experiences one encounters, species of experiences abstracted from their individually varying instances. When the SI type perceives something, they naturally relate it to and understand it in terms of their overall composite form of that thing. An SI type might see a cat, for instance, and immediately their mind is aroused to a host of personally formed experiences and related ideas which they associate with the notion of cathood or catness. In this way, the SI type has a very detailed, complex, and profound relationship with things in the world. And unlike the NI type, whose relationship is more removed from the actual things in its content and pertains instead to their own ideas about those things, their own interpretations about those things, the SI type holds an actual relationship with those actual things and the way that they personally affected and continue to affect the SI type. It is important to note, however, that although the SI type owes much more to the object and tends to be much more grounded and tied down in their worldview, for if you want to put it that way, it would be a big mistake, one I think I've made in the past sometimes, to imply that the SI type themselves sees, sees things this way. On the contrary, the SI type, I think, often feels rather separate and independent of the external world. They want to understand the world not from mere fleeting moments of it, but from a position of timelessness above the individual objects. They thus find themselves in an intriguingly paradoxical situation, where their sense of concreteness is subjective and not dependent upon the external concrete world. Young actually notes that the SI type is more likely to question why anything exists at all, such as Heidegger, or even whether it exists at all. Descartes, uh, he was an INTP, but had tertiary prominent introverted sensation. And this because for the SI type, concreteness is not dependent upon the concreteness or rawness of external experiences, but upon their subjective meaningfulness for the subject composited over time. 
It is ironic, therefore, that although they are more grounded in what actually is the case, in, in that concrete sense, they actually are seeking to get above that all the time. While the NI type, who explores all the time what is not yet actual and in their interpretations of things, is always doing so in order to determine what is really going on presently, albeit under the surface. This helps provide an important distinction between the ISFJ and the INFJ, for the ISFJ has a much more genuinely timeless quality to their insights and descriptions when that comes from above in a certain sense, while the INFJ, while also coming from above, is often rather more contemporary and timely in what they're saying. Their work is much more rooted to what is happening in their own time and society, because such fleeting events are where the INFJ draws their raw data to conjecture from. For example, um, even in a work that uh, appears to be so incredibly abstract as Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Throughout that whole work, he's continually referencing very specific points and things that uh, Russell or Frege uh, have said on logic. And he says, and this is how my Tractatus relates back into these very contemporary things. And that can, same thing with Schopenhauer, where he'll, he'll reference things that are going on right now, or, or Jung, who will reference uh, current trends that he sees, and that can sometimes make the INFJ's writing a little bit harder to, to get a grip on if you're not very familiar with the society they were coming from. But I don't think that the ISFJ has that problem nearly as much because they're very naturally trying to get over and above that. The point being that the ISFJ is always seeking to transcend the merely contemporary and are drawing from the creative perspectives of NE to create a concrete vision of the world that is not dependent on the whirlwind of moments before them. They are, in this sense, like stabilizing pillars of how the world really is, for them, anyway. The ISFJ thinks very long and hard about what they say, precisely because the ISFJ feels the need to compare everything with actual experiences and trusted evidence, whereas the INFJ's nature is more geared to experiment out loud with broad brushstrokes of which they are quite certain of in the moment. As celebrity types pointed out in their ISFJ versus INFJ video, this is why ISFJs can seem less interested in typology or philosophy because they feel a deep need to make sure whatever they offer on a subject is heavily checked with their personal experiences of reality. So while the INFJ, granted that they're comfortable, is more willing to venture ideas and opinions on almost any subject, just for the fun of conjecturing, the ISFJ is generally far less comfortable taking that intuitive leap into open air. Though of course they can, and I've seen them do it, but they won't relish it in the same way the INFJ does, from my experience anyway. First, I would like to try to clear up some confusion about FE that I fear I've helped to encourage. Uh, and we'll see what people think of this. And namely, the notion that extroverted feeling, FE, likes things simply and only because the majority of people around them happen to like it. This is incorrect, and anyone who has talked honestly with any FE type knows it. One cannot be blamed for thinking this is the case, however, because Jung seems to say it in psychological types when he's talking about uh, the, the value judgment of F.E. regarding paintings and so forth. And furthermore, it would seem to follow very naturally from the basic definitions of extroverted as oriented by the objective factor and feeling as evaluation of desirability, goodness, badness, and other gradations of tone. Uh, thus leaving us with the definition, the combined definition, that evaluation of desirability oriented by the objective factor. And that really sounds an awful lot like liking Transformers movies because everybody around you does and not because of their own merit. Sorry if any of you guys like Transformers. I haven't really seen them, but I am just referencing pop culture. Anyway, but this is not at all what the definition means, precisely because the definition that I just gave doesn't say anything whatever about the emotions or tastes of the FE type themselves. That is to say, FE types, such as the ISFJ, 
actually do and say things with no other intent than causing, eliciting, or bringing about good feeling tones in the external world. And the methods and kinds of feeling tones are what are determined objectively by observation. For the FE type, the only relevant factor in determining what's best for another person is the objective signals they give off. I believe this is how the definition of FE should be taken, not as a deeply rooted evaluation that vibrates with their very soul. That part of them is handled in its own way by introverted thinking. Uh, rather, it's a pragmatic evaluation, a line drawn from A to B. They are oddly like extroverted thinking types in this way. Their focus is on accomplishment and results, reacting to what they perceive or uh, gather to objectively be the case. This is the opposite of introverted feeling or introverted thinking, which are focused on internal purity and consistency, on personal principles determined in spite of outside data. But these functions need a reconciler to negotiate their demands with outside reality and actually get things done. These negotiators, if you will, are TE and FE. On its own, FE is guided or influenced by the apparent manifested feelings of others, whereas FI is guided by the underlying feelings of others separate from the manifestations of those feelings. These two processes may come to the same conclusion, of course, but often there are deviations. FE's focus is on proper conduct towards others and proper feeling results towards others, not one's own feelings or intentions towards others. Those are certainly important, but not what FE itself deals with or is concerned about. For instance, I knew a woman whom I believe very strongly is an ISFJ, or at the very least, an FE type. She has continually struggled with a dominant introverted feeling relation. Now, this man is one of the nicest and most good-hearted people that she knows, and often attempts to help her out. But the fact that he does this drives her crazy because he keeps, according to her, disregarding what she specifically tells him would be helpful, in favor of what he himself has determined would be most helpful. For example, offering to watch her young toddler, but not following the specific instructions she gives him for said toddler, because he feels there isn't any problem with a toddler having ice cream for dinner as an occasional humorous treat, and no one is going to tell him otherwise. Obviously not all FI types are like that. Please understand that's not the point here. Uh, this is just one individual, but the principle still stands that the FE type both expects of others and does of themselves whatever they objectively determine is best for others by determining what will result in the best observable harmony and goodness. To continue on that theme, uh, we have to talk a little bit about introverted thinking. Uh, this extroverted feeling sense of external harmony is backed up by a complementary sense of internal consistency, TI. This is the ISFJ sense of propriety and duty that is sometimes made so much of. Now, inasmuch as introverted sensation concerns actual sensations and experiences, it is thus more intrusive and more immediately pressing on the SI type than NI is on the NI type, in, in my opinion. Thus, when combined with a desire for valuable feeling results springing from consistent logical principles of conduct, the ISFJ is given a much more profound sense of objectively assumed but subjectively formed decency. That is a code of right and wrong posited as objective, not because it is observed, but because it makes perfect rational sense to the ISFJ as what should be the code, whether people follow it or not. Insofar as it is clearly rationally right to the reason of the ISFJ and what's more, presses on their mind with a concrete weight unknown to the INFJ, at least in this way, they may feel they have a natural right and authority to stand up for it, this code, with unexpected obstinacy even before a public crowd, because what that person was doing was not right, was insensitive or rude or unwarranted or ultimately hurting other people, and I will not participate in it. Even if they don't do anything in the moment, as a rule they are sensitive to what they think is right and wrong, and are rather irked by violations of this law. 
Now, just as the INFJ has many intriguing similarities with the ISTP, so too does the ISFJ have many similarities with the INTP. Both pairs share an introverted realm, if you will. For the INFJ and ISTP, it's governed by intuition and thinking, where they seek to personally model the framework of a thing by perceiving into what they feel is its essential abstract nature. In short, blueprinting via insight or epiphany. But the INTP and ISFJ are governed by sensation and thinking. So while they also blueprint reality and its aspects via TI, they do so by perceiving its essential concrete nature. In other words, blueprinting via history and memory. The point is that both the INFJ and ISFJ have a sense of puzzle solving to them, but the INFJ tends to prefer puzzles that require penetrating insights and sweeps of interpretation and generalization that get right to the abstracted core of an issue. The ISFJ, on the other hand, prefers to solve puzzles that require keen attention and memory, patience and meticulousness. Overall, what I'll call here mindfulness. That is an ability to hold in one's mind not just the general idea behind a thing, but what the thing concretely is, details and all, and then to organize that impression rationally in terms of other impressions and thus have a grounded, logical picture of their environment carried around in their head for reference. So while the INFJ is more of a psychologist or diagnostician who's jotting down and later organizing generalizations and interpretations of certain symptoms they perceive, the ISFJ is more of a detective, writing down all the important details of a crime scene that they later organize and then cross-check in order to recreate a mental picture of what really went down at the crime scene. In fact, I found the image of a detective to be useful in understanding the ISFJ's internal world. As an INFJ, I struggle immensely to keep straight details and sensations in anything concrete. I always want to make the leap to something more abstract and into generalizations and assumptions and all that fun, juicy, philosophical stuff. The ISFJ doesn't do this, however, but is able to keep themselves on the ground, recreating, as it were, actual events rather than interpretations of events. For example, I have another close ISFJ friend, one who loves family history and genealogy research because for her, it is like a mystery where she gets to recreate the actual events that led to such and such records being recorded in such and such a way. She loves the sense of completion that comes from it, of finally being able to picture coherently what is going on in the records. When we think of propriety, we usually share an image of someone aggressively average by the terms given in society. But insofar as the ISFJ has a very personal sense of propriety, as I was describing with TI, not only are they not guaranteed to appear very norm-friendly, but are actually fairly likely to find themselves and their sense of right and wrong to be at frequent variance with society. Um, with that in mind, we can better understand what has been observed, especially by celebrity types and many ISFJs, a natural eccentricity to them that either is clearly apparent or more likely doesn't come out until the ISFJ is known more closely. Just as the INTP has oddly timed moments of great warmth and cuddliness, you could even say, or the INFJ has flashes of sensual brutality, for lack of a better word, in their descriptions of things, or the ENTJ becomes unexpectedly sentimental or ruthlessly defensive of individuality, just so the ISFJ's inferior extroverted intuition, I believe, manifests most clearly in unexpected moments of great experimental oddity a sudden willingness and great urge to get out there and play with ideas and, and everything they normally regard as too weird or random. While I fear I overemphasized it in my INFJ revisit video, I am trying to explore more of the positive ac aspects of inferior functions and how the dominant function is, in a sense, seeking a unification between the dominant and the inferior. In this vein, then, I will suggest in this video, too, that the sense of unification appears when the ISFJ uses their senses of memory and dedication and meticulousness to realize what are, in effect, extremely new and novel approaches to things. Especially later in life, one finds the ISFJ with 
more and more determination reaching their feet out into the open air of possibility and novelty. Perhaps the best known examples of this unification uh, could be the acting careers of Christopher Walken and Anthony Hopkins. In their personal lives, they've demonstrated a meticulous conscientiousness approaching compulsivity in some cases, which is a very frequent sign of introverted sensation with introverted thinking, that kind of mindfulness. But in the outlet of their acting, they've striven and mostly succeeded in producing such odd, creative, different, yet peculiarly compelling characters. NE is not usually so clearly present in normal ISFJs, however, probably because most don't have the kind of outlets that Walken and Hopkins have. But it comes out in its own ways. So the best example in my own life is that ISFJ genealogy enthusiast I mentioned very suddenly, suddenly suggesting a course of action without prompting or apparent reasoning. Little things, like a bizarre movie to watch or an unprecedented day trip idea or the insistence that we need to get out and do something entirely new, which comes about every uh, five months or so, and gets me every time, whenever it happens. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> These are the more radical examples, but uh, even just in everyday life, especially as the ISFJ gets older, I suspect, one sees them trying out new recipes with declarations that they are doing so, or trying out new routines, or constantly rearranging the furniture, and. Uh, thus I have ended this video on a rather lighter note than I have in my last few videos, like the INFJ video. So you're, you're welcome. <laughs>